started it yet. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It says live here, but mm -hmm. then. <clears throat> uh, why didn't it go? Just a second. Let me check. Yes, it has started. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. So. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome one and all for this very special um, July edition of the uh, joint IISC TIFR webinar series in chemical sciences. We have Professor Thomas Ebison from the University of Strasbourg, France. Uh, of course, he has many affiliations, and I think Satish will expand on it pretty soon. Um, but I just want, would like to welcome all of you from YouTube and Zoom. Uh, who are joining in uh, for the first time in this series. Um, this series was conceived by um, uh, Professor Satish Patil and, and myself uh, some time back last year, where during the pandemic, we had a hard time uh, networking with scientists across uh, physically. So um, it actually was a concept that both of us thought that it'd be nice if we can organize, um, you know, tutorial style talks in chemical sciences for the benefit of not only the new faculty members and the existing ones in India, but also especially for the students who are getting trained in doing research, high quality research in the country. And uh, through these series, we invite experts like Professor Everson to talk about new topics, the modern topics um, in which you might actually go back and look at literature but sometimes you find hard uh, actually following it in the practicing in the lab. So um, you would like to talk to an expert and uh, Professor Ebison uh, is uh, no different in this case for light matter strong coupling. Um, and this will allow us for actually uh, disseminating this, the, the fundamental concepts in the field, but also the challenges that exist as the field moves forward. So these two talks would help us enumerate these two. Uh, this two is really uh, theme focus of these series. Um, we are very thankful that the American Chemical Society has stepped forward and supported this concept uh, started by these two institutes. And uh, uh, we thank Deeksha Gupta, Ajay Jha for supporting it through the ACS Science Talks and also actually giving us the Zoom license to use uh, for these series. Um, without further ado, I would like to now ask Professor Satish Patil uh, from the Indian Institute of Science to formally introduce today's speaker, Professor Thomas Ellison. Satish. Okay. Thank you, JD. Uh, in, so let me start welcoming for this ISC TIFR webinar. So it's indeed, it's my immense pleasure to introduce Professor Thomas Ellison. Uh, he's a physical chemist, he's born in uh, Oslo, Norway, but however, he's educated in uh, United States and France. He's received his uh, undergraduate um, bachelor degree from Oberyn College in US, and subsequently he obtained his PhD from the Curie University in Paris. Uh, he then did research both in United States as well as in Japan, and notably at NEC. Before uh, returning to the France in 1999 to help build a new institute at the University of Strasbourg. Uh, he's currently head of the Center for Frontier Research in Chemistry uh, in the Strasbourg Institute of Advanced Studies. He also holds a position of chair of a physical chemistry of a light matter interaction. He has authored many, many very pioneering papers and patents. Uh, and he also received uh, numerous awards for his pioneering research, uh, including. 2014 Kabli Prize in Nanoscience for his transformative contribution to nano optics. He's a member of the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters and foreign member of the French Academy of Science. So with this brief introduction, I invite Professor Ebison to begin his talk. Uh, over to you, Professor Ebison. Thank you. I hope you can all hear me well and, and let me know if there's any technical problems. It was a pleasure to give this talk. Uh, and thank you for the invitation to do this. And um, yeah, I have lots of good memories of India and we have, as I 
as some of the organizers know, uh, we have actually presently five Indians in my group, which is the largest contingent, uh, multinational cons of a multinational contingent. I'm going to talk to you about light matter interactions in a broad sense. And so light matter strong coupling is a subtopic of this. But to understand this topic, one has to have look at the bigger picture. And for the bigger picture, I'm, I'm uh, going to start by making a quite a long introduction about light matter interactions in general, and things you know, and then things you probably don't know. So, um, oops, how do I move this? Uh, this way, no, how do I? Just uh, press, uh, just go right click and do next. Sometimes it gets stuck. Right click and next. I don't know if you have Mac, but yeah. Next. Oh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, uh, so um, first thing we have, as you know, light iterations are ubiquitous. And I think not enough people appreciate that. For example, the fact that you can see me and I can see you is because uh, the, some camera is taking the light, turning it electric signal, which is then covered yet back into a light signal. It travels from here under the ocean, all around Africa, back to India, and, and in returns. And uh, we use light in not just for telecommunication, we use it for from cutting welding metals to surgery. But light matter interactions also uh, in nature. And, uh, and um, the most obvious one is vision. And uh, there, you know, we think of just think of photos isomerization reaction that actually allows us to see each other very fast, very well understood. There's much work on this on this topic, it's topics like this. Uh, and then there are light matters in the biosphere, why life is here, we probably wouldn't be here. So this is not a typical Indian picture, this is uh, from my native country. And that's uh, at midday. That's how light it gets in the, maybe on a sunny day in the wintertime, if you're lucky. And, uh, and uh, needless to say, plants cannot just, there's not enough photons in this light to, to in the sunlight to actually drive uh, plants, uh, photosynthesis, and, uh, and uh, there's a whole mechanism, and you probably know this, energy transfer, because I'm going to talk about energy transfer later on uh, or tomorrow. There's energy transfer in these plants. Essentially, the flux of light from the sun is not big enough to drive the chemistry, the electron transfer chains that follow. So nature, or at least not efficiently, so nature has developed these antenna systems of many chlorophyll molecules, and energy transfer between these uh, molecules, uh, photosynthetic molecules, drives the, the increase the rate uh, uh, of number of photons catch, caught by the photosystems by a factor of roughly 300, which is enough to make a difference and make the process much more efficient. This, of course, becomes ever more important the further north you go. And uh, um, here are some examples, very simple again. I'm sure all of you, uh, all the students know this, but I'm still going to remind them because what we learn is often goes in goes into one ear and one eye and leaves the brain base soon afterwards. So absorption, uh, typically uh, an emission, are often represented like this. And I'm going to talk a lot about absorption emission. And and I just remind you at the representation we have of these processes and uh, that the electronic states and vibrational subbands are just represented like that. But of course, in reality they should be represented like in these nuclear coordinates as shown on top right here. And, uh, and uh, absorption emission are, they looks like they're related. They can be, but not necessarily. And uh, there are all these processes going on in this molecular diagram. This is also a re rehash of what you probably all know. There are lots of processes going on between molecules in excited states and, and so forth. I'm not going to detail to them, but there are lifetimes that are important that drive and that determine what we can do with these states, such as chemistry, photochemistry, electron transfer, energy transfer. And more important for a lot of the part of my talk is that there are, I remind you that there are three N minus six vibrational modes, where N is the number of atoms of a molecule. So typically a dye molecule, a standard dye molecule has 100 to 200 vibrational normal modes. And, uh, and of course, the presence of all these normal modes means that IVR, internet, internal vibrational relaxation, is very prominent, dominates a lot of processes. And, uh, and at high concentrations, which I will often use in these talks, then of course, this intermolecular interactions can further 
uh, change these, uh, these the dynamics, and especially the, the non-radiative paths. So what now I'm coming to what you probably, most of you probably are not familiar with, and that is light matter interactions in the dark. And, uh, and uh, when you talk about, uh, you know, you take a droplet like this, most of us don't know that, or I didn't know until about 15 years ago that there were light matter interactions in a droplet. And like this, uh, in the dark. And how is that possible? To understand that, uh, you have to uh, understand what vacuum is. And so vacuum has been discussed for literally a, at least a couple of thousand years in the Mediterranean and Western world, maybe longer in India and China, but at least this long, uh, uh, we, we, have, we, have, we know that they discussed it in the times of the Greeks, for example, and we have traces of that in documents. And Aristotle thought that vacuum didn't exist, that uh, there couldn't be such thing as a total void of anything. Uh, Democritus, who gave us atoms, uh, said, no, 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 there has, to be, there has to be something space between atoms, because how could two things mix? So there had to be some void in between the matter. So think of them, you know, even 2,000 years ago, they might have mixed wine and water and seen that it all became homogeneous. So there had to be some space for the red stuff to mix with an uncolored stuff or sugar to dissolve in water, for example. And so, uh, but it's Aristotle's view that, per, uh, the, that, that survived into the Middle Ages. We know about these things because Lucretius, who was, a, if I remember correctly, a, a Roman person, wrote a book about what Democritus, Democritus and all these other people thought. And it's unbelievably modern. Uh, their notions they had of what's the discussions they had at the time. So in the Middle Ages, people thought what Aristotle thought, essentially, uh, nature has a horror of, 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 a, of a void. And uh, then everything changed in the middle of the 10th, 12th, 17th century. In the middle of the 17th century, we have the advent of modern science, or take modern scientific techniques, let's put it that way, in a systematic way, when this became systematized and people started making vacuums for scientific purposes. Now, when I first read this, I was very surprised because I thought, vacuum, did they have vacuum pumps? Yes, they did have vacuum pumps. And actually vacuum pumps have existed for maybe 2000 years. So this is nothing new. They were of course hand pumps. They weren't uh, you know, electric pumps. And, uh, and in, in Europe, there were in Italy, Torricelli, in Germany, Van Gerek, in France, Blaise Pascal, who made these experiments. Von Gerich is, is remembered the most from his sort of more flashy experiments. He would, uh, he would take uh, uh, two metal half spheres like this with a liner, put them together, pull a vacuum, and then he would go into a village and show that he couldn't separate the two halves and, and people would be very impressed. It looked like magic because when he opened the valve and let air in, he could separate them, but nobody else could. So he had to repeat it in front of his, the local prince apparently. And this is an illustration, sort of an Instagram from 6054 of this event. And you have eight horses on both sides trying to pull apart these spheres uh, unsuccessfully. And, uh, but that, that was the show. That didn't really advance science. What really has advanced science was the work by Torricelli and, and, and Blaise Pascal, who showed that, who took a vacuum in a, in a glass uh, line. And so you might wonder how they had glass lines. Well, remember, we are in Europe. They drank a lot of wine, and distillation was a big part of the business. And, and so they had glassware. And so they used glassware to pull a vacuum. And when they did that, what surprised them the most was the fact that light traveled through the glass. And they, hadn't, they were not aware that, that they thought that, they had to be, that light had to travel into something, a bit like waves travel the surface of water that uh, light had to travel into something. So they, of course, thought that the, the, their pipes were empty of matter. But of course, it wasn't quite empty of matter. But that's another issue. So this raised questions. And so the notion of ether, which was sort of another middle-aged concept, came back. And people said, well, after you pull all the matter, there's ether in the, in the, in the glassware. And this actually persisted right through the 19th century when uh, when uh, Maxwell 
developed his equations, which I find it absolutely extraordinary when you look at the meaning of those equations. And it's only uh, in the 20th century with the work of Einstein and particularly special and general relativity and the fact that the speed of light was constant that this suddenly avoid the, the vacuum is just a void of everything. It's just space time. And light just travel in this three dimensional space. It has nothing in it. And it follows the curvature of space as deformed by gravity. So the ether, this notion of ether disappears. But at the time, it raises also a lot of questions. And as, as quantum, uh, quantum mechanics develop, uh, people try to understand how, uh, how, how do things interact at the distance? Fields, what are fields? What are magnetic fields, electric fields? And then uh, in the light, in the 20s, 1926, so about 100 years ago, nearly 100 years ago, Dirac comes up with a quantification and of uh, the field, and the, that's the beginning of quantum electrodynamics. And then everything changes. The notion of vacuum radically changes. Vacuum, a vacuum is no longer the three dimensional space, is no longer a void, it's full of stuff full of things that come into existence and disappear all the time. There are fluctuations, and I'll explain why in a second. So uh, you might think, how do we know this? Well, we'll come to it in a second, but uh, uh, at the time, Dirac, this, this uh, quantification of the fields led also to the prediction that, that antiparticles existed and they were discovered. And of course, this was absolutely amazing. Uh, 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 theoretical prediction. So, um, how can we? How do we? How we could, why? Why did I say that? It surprises. It's surprising that in the that Maxwell didn't realize that that vacuum was not nothing. Uh, and this comes from the fact that the, he gave the speed of the definition of the speed of light. It's one over the square root of the permittivity and uh, permeability of vacuum. Okay, so these words are, should be banned, in my opinion. Permittivity is just a dielectric constant of the vacuum. And the same thing is, so that's the electric response of vacuum. And uh, mu is just a magnetic response of vacuum. If vacuum was nothing, these two terms would be null and the speed of light will be infinite. The fact that the speed of light is actually quite slow resembles that of glass, actually very close to that of glass, means there has to be something in vacuum that gives it some, some values, gives these epsilon and mu some values. Actually, uh, we now, today, the, I've read many articles on this issue. Today, people think of the vacuum as a dielectric medium that can be manipulated. So why, why what does the light feel? So I remember, for those of you not familiar what the dielectric constant means, it's just how light, when it travels through a medium, gets slowed down. It's the simplest thing to think about. So why is light slowed down by traveling through nothing? If nothing is nothing. So uh, let me explain why. So uh, the, this is, there are all kinds of vacuum fields out there. It's not just, this is happening, for example, right now in your brain, in your finger, in your coffee cup, anywhere you want it. These things are happening. These fluctuations that you see here are gluon fluctuations. There are fluctuations. There are many kinds of vacuum fields. And they all have, that the means the field is quantified and has zero point energy. And you know how vibrations just have one half quantum of energy uh, when in the ground state. Well, it's the same thing. These things, the, the quantum states of all these fields, uh, even if they're in the ground state, they fluctuate. And this is what this represents. So when light travels through space, it senses, even if there's no trace of these things, we cannot see them, they leave no energy trace. Light traveling through this space senses all this. And, and uh, this is, was a surprise to me. So this is occurring, of course, very fast, uh, extremely fast. So the, now I'm just going to talk about one kind of vacuum field, namely the electromagnetic vacuum field, because this is the, what's relevant to everything else I'm going to say. So when light comes out, of the screen that you're watching or any light source. It actually just doesn't fly out. Well, like I learned in school, 
light just came out of a source, travels in some straight line. All this is actually quite nonsense. This is the that's because we have a, had a classical view of this. This is a classical view of all these processes. The reality is that light actually transits from the emitting source to a state in space. Why? Because uh, so light, the, 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 the field, essentially the, the way to understand the space or space time is that there are an infinite number of electromagnetic states in the universe. Mm -hmm. And when light flies out, it goes to one of these states and, and continues to travel. It doesn't, so you think, how do we know this? Well, because we can limit the number of states and completely change the emission probability. And I'll come back to that in a second. So, for example, we can, we can make a confined space in a Faraday cage, an optical Faraday cage made of metal, and the number of available states will diminish. And we can stop an atom or enhance its emission of an atom or a molecule. So this, this is surprising. To, was surprising to me. And another point that's very important is that all these quantum states for light, okay, I don't know what this is, but something is being recorded. Um, I have this thing on my screen. No, it's just, it just suddenly happened from the Zoom platform. Sorry, it, it, I don't know how it happened, but don't worry about it. Just... But can you get rid of that thing that's stuck on the screen? Yes, I don't know. Um, oh, this is in your Zoom platform. Oh, okay. So can you continue? Just press say continue. continue. Say continue. Yeah. But I cannot yeah. click on it. Can you oh, not yeah. click on it? Oh yes, now I could. Yeah. Okay. 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 Sorry. And so uh, and so, all of these electromagnetic states have zero point energy, so they fluctuate. These these electromagnetic fluctuations and their existence of all these states have a profound influence on material properties, really profound. And this is something we don't learn in chemistry, at least. So these fluctuations, sometimes people tell me they don't exist. So uh, even physicists, so I just remind them that they have actually been observed. There are papers by Leitenstorfer and Constance and Feist, uh, faced in ETH, have shown that they can be detected. So on average, there's a zero, they fluctuate everywhere. So on average, you don't see anything, but if you do very time result, very quick time resolved experiments, you can actually see the fluctuation through your, through your system. They play a role in Casimir force. So I don't probably many of you have probably many of you probably heard of Casimir force. That's sort of a microscopic force, Van der Waals force, if you think of it in a certain way. Casimir was a physicist at, at, uh, at uh, Philips in the Netherlands who understood that there were forces between colloids that were great, that weren't predicted by standard sort of, uh, physical chemistry at the time. This is the 1950s. And, and, uh, and uh, in modern version of these experiments to try to demonstrate their existence, this has not been done. You use two metal plates because they exclude the electromagnetic field because of the negative dielectric constant. And so when two plates come together, the, the, the number of fluctuations between the plates are less than the ones on the outside because you have a cutoff. You have a cutoff condition as shown here on the right. And that means the pressure, because these fluctuations leave a, a pressure. They don't leave any energy trace, but they leave a pressure. They induce a pressure. The two plates get pushed together. And if you think that force is small, it's not. It's as if, if our hands were totally smooth and I shook hands with one of you, and if we, our hands were so really, really smooth, we would have to need surgery to separate us. So you can be grateful that your hands are not totally smooth. And just can I stop you for a second, Professor Abbas? Yeah. There might yeah. be a question. Pranav, is there a question from you? Sorry? No, no, no. Okay, okay. okay. Yeah. So, so, uh, uh, so the same thing. So coming back to the droplet, this droplet here, there are Van der Waals forces keeping together. And we, as you have, if you're a physical, if you're in physical chemistry and probably in, and a big part of the audience know this, there are a number of forces, Van der Waals forces, and one of them is the London dispersion forces. And, and uh, these are induced dipoles. And uh, we learned this right-hand side when I was a student, I learned this many years ago, but what I didn't know is what make the fluctuating dipoles uh, in the electronic clouds. And this comes from the vacuum fluctuations. So the vacuum fluctuations drive these, these uh, uh, dipoles. So it plays many roles, this thing, but it's not only that. 
uh, we learn many other things that are not totally correct. So let me show you some other things. So they place so molecules. Now I'm going to focus on molecules mainly, and and this vacuum electromagnet. So there's no vacuum per se in our experiments. Okay. So this is something. Sometimes I give a talk like this for an hour, and then some postdoc or some faculty member comes to me after a talk and says, "How did I make the vacuum in our experiments?" There are no vacuum in the experiments. Vacuum here means space, three-dimensional space. Okay, it's a physicist language. So when you hear physicists talk about the vacuum field, they mean the vacuum, the electromagnetic zero point energy of space that exists everywhere around us. So this zero point energy, uh, these fluctuations of space time, are play a role in Van der Waals forces. They were also responsible for the lamb shift in the hydrogen atom. That Willis Lamb understood, uh, I think, before the first Second World War, he got the Nobel Prize for this because it essentially pointed out uh, that uh, that the, the quantum QED, quantum electron and vision of the world, was correct. Now, more important for chemists is that when I was a student and I'm a photophysical chemist by training, I learned there was such thing as spontaneous fluorescence and natural lifetime. Well, those are totally wrong notions. That should be banned. That should be rewritten. There's actually no such thing as spontaneous fluorescence. And this was understood by Einstein when they, quanti when they first did uh, uh, modern quantum mechanics. They couldn't explain what triggered emission. And this is not just fluorescence. This is the same thing to do with a lamp. Every emission process from your screen now, now is actually triggered by vacuum fluctuations. OK, there's, and a, so question. there's a question by <laughs> Professor Arun. Yeah. <laughs> The vacuum fluctuations are causing everything according to you now. Now, if I think about correlation and dispersion, the electron cloud around any atom on average is spherical, but at any instance, we have electrons always moving. Yeah. There could be a fluctuating dipole. The way we think about correlation is that when two of the atoms like argon come closer, the fluctuating dipoles get correlated. And can't uh, we have a fluctuating dipole without vacuum fluctuations? I don't know. And so, I, excuse me, because I'm going to get to the end of this. So I would like sure. to tell the whole audience that I have a, I have a slide, for, a moment for questions as we go along periodically. So because I won't be able to explain everything. I'm not done explaining. So it would be easier probably to ask the questions afterwards, if you don't mind. So. Uh, 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 but I welcome questions, but it's just hard for me to go through this whole reasoning. So I, I, uh, uh, so we'll, vacuum fluctuations are very important, and the question you raised is a very good one. Probably it plays a role, but I have no idea. So I haven't gotten that far yet. But vacuum fluctuations. So what are vacuum fluctuations? That's another question. What are they? People talk about virtual photons. What are virtual photons? Are they real? Yes, they are. Virtual photons are not virtual. They're virtual only in the sense that they're ephemeral. They come and go. So actually, vacuum fluctuations are virtual photons. OK, so you imagine a, a, a beginning of a, of a photon and it vanishes again. It leaves no energy trace. And, and, uh, and when Einstein, when Einstein uh, uh, worried about this house emission was occurring, this spontaneous emission, he knew this when he had apparently this, I've been told by some physicists, he knew that there was a problem with how spontaneous emission was triggered. In a stimulated emission, there's a photon that pushes the, the, the system down. In absorption, there's a photon pushing it up. So what's pushing the system down here? Because you can just reverse A1, A10 to B01, and you have the same thing. So actually, when the quantum fields were quantized, there then people understood. The virtual, this the vacuum fluctuations or the virtual photons that trigger the so-called spontaneous emission. Okay, and so then people, you can ask yourselves. So we have been thinking about this for the last fifteen years because what I'm talking about is sort of a summary of everything I've understood so far. So we have discussions, and we have had. I have physicists in my lab, chemists, even biologists once in a while, and we have discussions about what the meaning of all this is. And. Uh, uh, Tal Schwartz, who was a, was a physicist who was in my lab early on when we worked on this and was one of the first key people in the lab on working on strong coupling. We had a discussion over coffee one day and he said to me, uh, Thomas, think of it this way. You take a solution of molecules, you radiate them with a laser, you start seeing stimulated emission. When there's, a, when there's, 
when the when in, when in the spectrum you see half the emission is stimulated, half is so-called spontaneous, then you know there's 50-50% competition between the stimulation between this photon and the vacuum field. That laser burns your fingers. That gives you a density of these fluctuations. They're absolutely everywhere. It's a continuous background in our system. They keep our, our skin together. Maybe not so well when you get older, but they try to keep your skin together. So, so light doesn't emit into free space just like that. And it's not triggered. It, uh, there's no such thing as spontaneous uh, uh, emission. And therefore, for example, a quantum yield of emission, which we learn a lot about in chemistry, is a sort of in, internal quantum, is what you call it, uh, a natural quantum yield also is not really natural. So, but even more important, you want some discussion to talk with your non-scientist friends, you can tell that them that even a magnet on the fridge is exchanging photons with the fridge. Okay. Uh, all electric and magnetic forces are mediated by virtual photons. If you think of of, of, uh, of Higgs boson. Why were they looking for Higgs boson? Because a boson, because bosons carry are, are force carriers, and so so mediate forces. So Higgs bosons mediate gravity. Me electric and magnetic forces are mediated by virtual photons. Things like and in sodium chloride dipole dipole interaction. So this this uh, f levitating frog over a magnet in Netherlands is actually levitating thanks by exchanging photons with the magnet. Kind of weird, no? I think so. And it's kind of fascinating because I didn't know that. I mean, I always wondered how plus and minus recognized, how a plus charge recognized a plus charge when I was a student and, or, and how a plus charge recognized a neg negative charge. When you think about it, nobody teaches you that. But actually, if you, if you know that they are carried by virtual photons, it's just a phase relationship, which determines whether they're repulsive or, or, uh, or uh, attractive forces between static charges. And this should also be taught in chemistry. So now I'm ready for some questions. If people have questions about the first part. Yes, yes there are questions. So first of all, there is a question in the chat box um, uh, from Shourav. Can these virtual photons cause excitation, uh, like an absorption event, as opposed to emission? If they can generate, yeah, they trigger absorption. No, they trigger emission. They don't, they don't leave any energy trace. There has to be conservation of energy. But, but if you look at QED and and you, if you're familiar with Feynman diagrams, there are all kinds of absurd situations which can happen that have to be accounted for in QED, which allows you to predict values of things in nature. They take into account things that seem totally unintuitive, like excitation without photons, uh, you know, things like that. And, and, uh, and, and so, yes and no. No, you cannot see any excitation of molecules, but you can leave, it can leave a trace. It can affect the probability, the quantum probability of an event. Okay. Yeah, and what they call, what physicists will call the, the, the probability amplitude will be influenced by absurd events that you think is unintuitive and impossible. Okay. Um, the other question is um, uh, the, the yes. So when you showed the infinite space of states in one of your slides, is it bounded from below? Uh, this is a question from Chirag. Just let me see if I can. There's some way I can get, oh, I don't know why I cannot get back. Um, which, what slide was it? What about what? Uh, this was when you went, uh, go back a few slides. I'll tell you when you were starting to explain the vacuum uh, field. No, yes, this one. Yeah. Was it bounded from below? That's the question. No, no, I mean, it's just a, it's just an image to make people understand that an infinite number of vacuum states. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so of course it's not as simple as I show it here, but it's, you are, I, when I talk to chemists, I think of the fact that they use to energy transfer. So you can think of this as an energy transfer from a, from a molecule to a, a state in space. Huh? 
Okay. So uh, and and so that you understand why you're between molecules is totally normal. You don't have energy transfer between molecule without it being an acceptor state. Right. So emission essentially requires an acceptor state in space. And I'll show you experiments that prove this in a second. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. And then there is a just a, uh, there are two hands raised. I will let the speakers ask the question. I'll go with first with Pranav, um, yeah. and then come back to some chat. Chat questions again, Pranav. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, coming back to this idea of these energy levels, uh, Max Planck already proposed this idea in some sort of a, uh, in some sort of a manner without really bothering about zero point energy and so on. So how is this, you know, new updated uh, quantum electrodynamics picture? Uh, is it is it directly connected or is there you know newer additions in terms of uh, operation or or in terms of you know, uh, how we sort of estimate the fields. I, can I not, let's say, have a space which can I can model as different cavity modes in X, Y, and Z direction, uh, sum up, you know, at any given temperature, what kind of modes are going to be occupied. Is that enough or is there yeah, more think, needed? No, I, I mean, you can understand, you can treat most of this thing, even you know, strong coupling classically, but you cannot predict what we see. Mm -hmm. You cannot predict... Uh, uh, you can. I'll show you an. I'll give you two examples of a classical view of a given phenomena and a and a, and a, and, a, and a quantum view or QED view. I'll show you in the next few slides, and I'll show you the different. I'll show you the both interpretation work to, until a certain point. And one thing that classical physics cannot predict is is, for example, lifetime changes. Uh, you can, you know. Uh, uh, chemistry, modified chemistry, for example, that we do, uh, many other, there are many things that you can only explain by QED. QED is the only solid theory, I mean, is the most solid theory known to mankind, as far as I know. And okay. so that's why it should be integrated into chemistry. I actually teach these notions to second year chemistry students in Strasbourg because I feel it's important that the new generation of, of students learn this. Even without, I don't need to be, I'm not a theoretician. And I'm certainly not a physicist. I just have, by digging and digging and digging, I began to understand the concepts attached to this, which is the, what's important to transmit. Then the theoreticians will do the rest. The, 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 I don't know if the theory has changed much. What I do know is that it was Dirac that really made the difference. And then the people that follow him. Max Planck, of course, was uh, critical, and needless to say, in the beginning of quantification. And maybe he touched upon things, you know, Many people, uh, I mean, there are many, it's hard when you read, I've read history books on this and you can see that there are many people who contributed, even people we don't know whose names we don't know. Okay, uh, thank you, Pranav. Uh, Arunan? Yeah. Yeah, good. When the question about excitation by virtual photon was asked, I was thinking about the same answer that he gave, that conservation of energy has to be thought about. Yeah, so, 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 uh, let me just so here, so this, this is not absorption, huh? this is just trigger. Yeah, that's so there's no, there's no, there's no problem with energy conservation here. Yeah, the, if we, you did so I, what I said is that I, in if you look at Feynman diagrams, you have these little curlies like you have mm -hmm. an particle that starts emitting and reabsorbs, and it mm -hmm. has never been excited, mm -hmm. but you have these virtual events that can still occur. And if you want to predict something in QED, you have to sum, that's what Feynman does, he's find, find all these diagrams, he sums up all, all these sometimes absurd possibilities, non-intuitive possibilities, because they affect the probability landscape. I mean, quantum mechanics essentially is a, is a that's, you know, some, you, are, you are playing with ampli uh, probability amplitudes. The probability wise, maybe the excitation never happens. No. Sorry? Probability wise, maybe the excitation never happens with virtual photons. I sorry, I, I the, the sound is not good enough. I can what he's saying is probability wise, uh, the excitation never happens with virtual photons. That's what Aruna. No, 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 no. In real thing, no. But in 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 uh, uh, in a Feynman diagram, the event if it starts will disappear. Okay, so if it should happen, it will at the end leave no trace. There will be no real excitation. But it could be a virtual <clears throat> okay. so that almost makes it beyond science in a way. You know, if you cannot see it, yeah, yeah, of course. 
but you know your, your skin is held together by virtual photons so mm -hmm. uh, vacuum fluctuations so it plays a role you know uh, as, that's what we are playing all we are doing in our lab is playing with vacuum field okay. as you'll see okay uh, so okay. let me but i'm not but we were not the first one to do that so let me go to the uh, let me go to the uh, there's uh, one more there's yes. one more okay there's one more question yeah uh, at least i would uh, invite uh, panelists to actually unmute themselves and ask the question directly but apurva konar from iser bhopal he is asking is this vacuum em field and fluctuations of forces somehow related to entropy of the system ah interesting question An interesting question i don't know the answer okay thermodynamics certainly is is I mean, I, I'm sure the vacuum field has a plays a role in thermodynamics, but I don't haven't thought of that. Very good point. Okay, and if I would. If he has any idea, or he or she has any idea, they should correct me. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and I would uh, invite uh, Saurabh Datta and Jinu George both to comment on these things because there were some discussions going on in the chat. Um, I, I guess um, uh, Saurabh, could you unmute yourself? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's okay. I mean, so uh, yeah, I think this is being a long discussion, but I think yeah, entropy. If you bring into picture, then there is an explanation that uh, you can say that uh, going from uh, excited state to uh, uh, a lower state for a small system will increase the overall entropy of the system plus the surrounding. whereas if you try to do the other way round where you want to go from the ground state of the system to a excited state actually your entropy equally it is forbidden because the overall entropy of the system for the surrounding will not be positive that i mean the change in entropy won't be positive but that that's from a uh, yeah statistical mechanics or thermodynamics perspective okay. but i okay. don't see any reason why energy uh, conservation is violated in In either process, in, like in photo excitation, in photo excitation from ground state to excited state. Right. That's what you're saying. This is what I think. Okay. Okay. Fine. Okay. Okay. Well, I I think we will move on. Yeah. And let's take move a next set of questions after some time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thomas, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So there are, there are two coupling regimes: the weak and strong. So I'm just going to give a few slides on the weak because it illustrates what we just seen. So actually the They, there you modify the radiative properties, and this again it comes back to what what is emission. So uh, there's a famous experiment which is considered the first cavity QED experiment ever done by these two physicists. They say it's the first one, Arosh and Kleppner, and Arosh got the Nobel Prize a few years ago, and Kleppner is his colleague from MIT. He wrote his paper in 1989, which inspired me, and I'll come back to that later on. And Carl Drexager is a physical chemist who did experiments actually in '68. These experiments are shown up out here, and is reviewed in his progress in optics in 1974. So what he did is he used Langmuir Blodgett technique, which I assume all of you know what it is. So he deposited monolayers of inert layers on a on a mirror, and and uh, Then added a layer with fluorophores. This European fluorophores that has a very narrow emission band, and therefore suitable for these experiments. And what he saw was that as he could then control the distance between his European complex and his macroscopic uh, mirror by uh, with nanometer uh, precision in a time when nano science was not super easy, and uh, at very close to the metal surface. Uh, there's quenching because there's energy transfer to the metal. This is well known. Depends on orientation, but very well known. And then as he moves away from the mirror, the lifetime goes up, down. But at the same time, the emission probability goes up. Why is that? It's because he uh, and, and then it reverses, and and the lifetime goes up, and the emission probability goes down. The emission probability intensity goes up, and so forth, until you get far enough from the from the mirror. A sort of micron distance from the mirror. And what's happening? So I'll give you first uh, the QED version of it. The QED version of it is simply that, as uh, as as pointed out by Arosh and Kleppner, is that when you move away from the mirror, the the mirror interrupts space, and to the molecule sitting right next to the surface, this is a huge perturbation of vacuum of space. So imagine a a, a mirror the size of Half the galaxy sitting next to the Earth, it would perturb our vision to help things, and so this molecule senses this presence of this mirror, 
and the density of optical states is modified. And so when you go, when it, when it has, when it's emitting, in, uh, when its lifetime is shortened and emission quantum L goes up, it's because the density of these optical states go up. So the, the states, the number of states receiving, the, being able to receive the photons increases. So it emits faster and KR goes up, the quantum yield goes up. Then you go a little bit further and there are very few states and the lifetime goes up and emission quantum yield goes down and so forth. And as you eventually you, reach, you, you get the so-called natural emission lifetime and natural quantum yield, which is not natural as I just showed you. This is, a, this is a very simple proof that the properties of an emitter is not that of the emitter itself alone, but in its environment of vacuum states. Okay, so then you can ask yourself, what's the meaning of such things as fluorescence, intrinsic fluorescence quantum yield and lifetimes? Now there's a classical treatment of this. The classical treatment says that when light tries to emit from the molecule, it bounces off the mirror and interferes with itself, okay? And, and that is another classical experiment, but essentially there are enough other experiments that shows that that vision is not, is okay, but not the correct one, okay? So density of states of vacuum determine emission probability. And uh, since that beautiful experiment has been done with atoms and by Arosh and Kleppner in cavities, and you can engineer things in a very beautiful way. There are modern versions of this. So for example, you can take a hole, I'm gonna talk about holes a little bit later on. And this is an experiment by a group at, at uh, Cornell in the US, where they, they, they use a tiny hole to do fluorescence correlation spectroscopy. I don't know if you know what FCS is, but FCS essentially, you look at, you look at very few number of molecules and you see the fluctuations, the statistics, the, the fluctuations, creating statistics or emission statistics. And from that, you can derive diffusion times and so forth. It's an important tool in biology, not, most notably. And it's defined, and if you want to see fluctuation statistics, you need uh, photon statistics, you need a very small, uh, interrogate very few molecules. And so you have to work with very dilute solutions to see the fluctuations. And so in order to, in the focal spot of a laser is typically a micron. So they decided to make use a little aperture in a metal film to define a much smaller volume and thereby collect the same information so they could work at high concentration. Now, what's really surprising is that you get more photons in a system like that than you get in solution. And this is very surprising. And this, uh, why, why do you see that? And again, this has to do with controlling emission probability. So a more modern version of that, which, in which I was involved in with this French group, is that you make uh, uh, an antenna made of little corrugated metal here, gold film that's corrugated. And on the opposite side, it's filled here. And on the opposite side, you have a solution of molecules that can go into this tiny hole here. And you pump the system from, the, from this antenna side the field piles up on top of the hole for reasons I'll explain a bit later on. And, and so you enhance the excitation rate. But because you are changed the density of states, you also increase the emission rate because you change the density of optical states here. They can involve plasmons and all kinds of things. I'm not gonna go into detail. And on top of this last, this bullseye, which is known, this structure is known as bullseye, also allows you to beam the light, the emitted light in the direction and improves uh, the FCS by orders of magnitude. So these kinds of things can be used. The weak coupling process can be used to change the density of states and thereby, the weak coupling is also, uh, the changing the emission probability is also known as Purcell effect. A lot of people think Purcell effect is just to go up in intensity, but Purcell effect can also reduce the intensity. It's the same process. So, do you have any questions on this little part before I go to strong coupling? Um, okay, I'll move on. I don't know if it's too soon, but I just wanted to do step by step. Yeah, so there is a question from um, Chirag Arora. Chirag, could you unmute yourself? It would be nice if you directly ask it, if you can decouple the vacuum of that. Yeah. So I was wondering that if we can at all decouple the effect of vacuum on an emitter and get the truly natural lifetime of the emitter. 
uh, if there's no emitting state, there's no emission. So if you decouple entirely, there won't be any emission process. Okay. Yeah, the fluctuations kind of weird, are measured. Yeah, if the there was no vacuum field, you wouldn't be right. seeing me on the screen. Right. The light wouldn't reach your eyes. So okay. just right now, light is coming out to your screen, traveling to your eye and being reabsorbed, but it's, it's mediated by states in between. Right? That's why I'm telling you this, because I, for me, it's absolutely uh, something so far from what I learned that I think is important that more people know it. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Watson Thank is you. asking, could you please explain slide number 21 again? So if you go back two slides. Yeah. 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 So, so, here, so here you have a, this is a metal film on a glass slide. Okay on which we have uh, drilled uh, a corrugated a corrugation into the glass with a focused ion beam. And on the opposite side, there's a, there's a solution, but it cannot go through, it's filled here and it doesn't show up here. And, uh, and uh, molecules come into this, a few molecules come into this hole and they emit. And you want to collect the statistics of the emission for FCS. When you do this, you pump from the, 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 this side, from the side of the bullseye, because that's like an antenna, a plasmonic antenna. And a plasmon, I'll show it a little bit later, the, incre the, the field is very strong on top of, of the hole here. And it allows you to, this, the, the antenna puts, puts nearly all the light amplitude here above the hole, so it increases the excitation intensity. And then, the, when light wants to emit it, because it emits into the same, you have created a lot of mode density in the, by this having the structure here, it emits with a higher probability. And so you have enhancement of excitation and emission. And the last thing is that, that the bullseye like that actually beams the light. This is something we showed in a paper in science in, 19, uh, in 2002 or something like that. And so, uh, and so it beams, and these people are using this to beam the light, and that's shown in red here. So this is the enhanced emission uh, with with emission without corrugation and with corrugation, it's beamed towards the detector. Okay. Okay. Um, good. Um, there's one question from Apurba Kunar. Apurba, could you could you please uh, unmute? Yeah. So I was thinking about uh, this effect as this Lakovich uh, showed this uh, radiative decay engineering. So when they are putting some fluorophore on the surface of uh, metallic nanoparticles or metal surface of silver, gold, they can see this uh, radiative rate changes. So is that the similar kind of effect? Uh, yes. So is that the local field effect or? Yeah, a local field. It can be local field. For plasmons, it's going to be local. Huh? But it's the same principle, yeah. Okay. Except here it's in a more controlled way. It's more quantitative, easier to do. I don't know if it's easier, but it's <laughs> this is actually a very difficult experiment because to make the engineering structure is not easy. But uh, yeah, it's a more con there, is, there are more control parameters in this experiment. Let's put it that way because the structure is well defined. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Now you can proceed. Yeah. So now I'm going to talk about strong coupling regime. And I'm coming to the core of the thing and I need to get you this whole picture for you. You understand that light matter interaction is way beyond light that you can see. They will kill all over the place. And now we're gonna see what we can do with these things on a much more interesting regime where you generate hybrid light matter states. And that's the crux of the whole, everything I'm gonna tell you about. So to understand that, uh, you have to look at these micro metronomes. Let me just stop it. Oh, okay, I'll just stop it for a second. So I'm going to talk about classical coupled oscillators. So coupled oscillators were understood also in 1650, so nearly 400 years ago, by Huygens, the guy who gave us interference. So Huygens in, is the inventor of the pendula clock, you know, the clock with the pendula, old-fashioned pendula clock. I don't know if you had those uh, also in India, but they were everywhere in Europe. When I was young still, you could still find it in your grandparents' house. And uh, the pendula clock was invented by him in a way it was a very precise clock in 1650s. There was, this was state of the art timing. This was very important because it saved, it allowed ships to position themselves more 
precisely at the ocean, avoided all kinds of dangerous situations because they would know where they were according to how much time had traveled and so forth and position the sun and all kinds of things. So this was a small revolution at the time. And of course, Huygens was probably not poor because you couldn't do science without, without having money in those days. And, uh, and so, uh, and there was no funding agency. So uh, he probably had more than one pendula and he noticed that the pendula would, would couple and they would start oscillating together. And he probably wondered why. And he understood the problem of coupled oscillators. And there you have these two pendula and they either move in phase in the ground state or out of phase in the excited state. And here's a, here's a modern version with five metronomes that you've shown here from YouTube. And they are, uh, they are at the same frequency, but out of phase. So now you can hear and see what happens. Okay, you saw they all became in phase. Okay, so this looks like I actually did this in a music store and the, the music store owner thought I was doing magic. Okay, this is not magic, of course, this is just science. So what's happening here? Why does he have, does anybody know why they have to be on a, on a can to see this? Any one of the students know why? No? Okay, so these, these they have to be on cans because they have to exchange mechanical energy the two oscillators have to exchange mechanical energy faster than dissipation. If they, if, if they are not on the rolling cans, all the, the energy exchange that goes through the base plate will be lost as friction. So only if they are all exchanging and faster than dissipation do you get these collective states. And you see all these, these all the, there's one with 30 online. Now you can find one with 30 or 60 of them and it, you can't hear anything, it's so noisy. And they all start oscillating in phase. That's what we're going to do in strong coupling. We're going to put a lot of molecules and they're going to all oscillate together. Mechanically, actually, the vibrations are going to oscillate or the electronic clouds are going to oscillate. So this is very important to understand what happens next. Okay. So uh, sometimes people ask me what happens afterwards if you put them down on the ground. Since we cannot talk in an audience here so easily, I can tell you that they don't stay in phase once you, once you put it on the back on the surface here. Okay. So now there's a, something very similar that you've heard about if you listen to talk by Frank Spano, it's J aggregates and H aggregates. In the J aggregate, when you have molecules that are aligned in such a way that their transition dipole, if they form a crystal in such a way as their transition dipole moments are aligned, the transition dipole moments fluctuate. Again, for quantum reasons, they all, everything fluctuates in nature. So this, this, molecular resonance and this one fluctuates and they start talking to each other. I told you all, all uh, electric and magnetic interactions were driven by virtual photons. They are exchanging virtual photons. That's how they make these two new states. Okay. Otherwise you can even see the equations that, Spano, uh, that Spano gave, which shows that they are, there's an excitation in the system. Where does that excitation come from? There's no excitation in the dark, but Jack gets these states still form in the dark. You can do electrochemistry and put an electron on this even in the dark, right? So these states, these are solutions, quantum mechanical solutions that are constructed from this exchange process. And so these aggregate states are very, the properties of these aggregated uh, systems are very different from the monomer. And everybody thinks this is totally normal. You would think so if you're a chemist, since probably most of the audience are chemists, you have no problems with this. And so you won't be surprised that when I learned that you could do the same thing, oops, I could do the same thing with an optical resonance. I could, I could have an, if I could put the molecule, molecules inside an optical resonator and have them talk to each other by being at having, having uh, being isoenergetic here, these two transitions here, they will both fluctuate and they'll exchange virtual photons and you get new states. But these states are hybrid light matter states. 
And that is probably the most surprising thing to most people. So how on earth could you make hybrid light matter states? Uh, this is not what you think about normally. And, uh, and, uh, and the question is, when I first learned that this was possible, the thing that came to my mind immediately is, what does it do to the properties? Drag gets have different properties. Why shouldn't they have, why shouldn't the system have different properties? I'm not talking about optical properties in the sense of, uh, sorry, I'm gonna close the window. I have some construction outside my door, my window. That's okay. It's, it's really minimal. And, uh, sorry, it's gonna get worse. So it's sorry. fine, it's fine. And so, so the question is why, what are these properties of these states? That's the first thing that came to my mind. And secondly, what does it do to overall material limit uh, properties? So uh, now a little bit of harder, harder stuff. So these states are essentially just a mixing of a ground state and a photon in the cavity, a virtual photon maybe, and an excited state and zero photon in the cavity with little coefficients, a bit like doing linear, linear combination of atomic orbitals, nothing different. You have a, a no node and a node. That's what defines minus and plus. And these, these states are called polaritonic states. Sometimes people call them polaritons, but that's like calling electronic states electrons. So I don't like that, that's too confusing. So just remember they're polaritonic states. And, and the P minus stands for this sign here. Now the gap between those two states is known as the Rabi splitting. And, and this Rabi splitting is essentially given by some interaction term that I come to and dissipation in the cavity, dissipation, et cetera. They're the same as these couple oscillators. And if you forget about dissipation for a, while, for a moment, this, if you, you neglect these dissipation terms, then the, the Rabi splitting is just given by the transition dipole moment times the strength of the photon field, electric, the electric part of the photon field or the yeah, electromagnetic field inside the cavity. And that's in, inversely proportional to the to the volume that that field, that mode occupies. So in, uh, in tiny structures, like in plasmonic structures that somebody asked a question about just now, they will be tiny, the field will be squeezed. So this term will be very small and therefore this, this overall term will be very large. And so in mo with molecules with high transition dipole moments and in, done in modern nano cavities or micro cavities, both these terms favor a large Rabi splitting. Then it depends on the number of photons plus one. And this one comes from some fundamental quantum electrodynamic issue, the non-commutation of the annihilation and creation operators. And I'm not going to go into that, but you just have to trust me that this one represents the vacuum field. So even when the number of photons goes to zero, there's a Rabi splitting, just like in the J aggregates. So that was a one atom or one molecule. But what people have shown is that you can couple, a cavity is tiny, so you can put lots of molecules inside, a cavity is large compared to a molecule, and so you can put a lot of molecules inside the cavity. And you can have the, 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 the molecule, the cavity exchange virtual photons with a large number of identical molecules. This from a quantum mechanical point of view is very favorable. This increases the splitting, the Rabi splitting, once you normalize and so forth, to by square root of n. So n being the molecules that are coupled to the cavity. And so now you're going from a single molecule being on the order of, I don't know, electron, uh, micro electron volts to being on the order of a volt, electron volts. So now you have huge Rabi splittings, which of course perturb the properties of the system. These are collective. This is collective coupling. This was already demonstrated 40 years ago with atoms. It works very well. So why is this favorable? Because then, then, you, are, then you can work with, it's much easier to achieve strong coupling because you can overcome dissipation of the cavity much better because you exchange it with many more, the, the, the probability of a photo, virtual photon being reabsorbed by a, a molecule inside the cavity increases as square root of n. But this also leads to the formation of dark states because there's only two bright states. And so there leads to dark states, uh, which are linear combinations of zero photon the cavity and all the molecules in the ground state plus one excitation. But the presence of one excitation and the fact that they are collective means that they are not, do not have the properties of the, the bare molecules, the molecules in an 
as you know them. A lot of people make that mistake and, and uh, they are far from being that. So now you have these correct collective, uh, uh, coherent collective states, the brown state, first excited state, second excited state. So you imagine that's a molecule. Now you start adding this to a cavity and you start achieving the strong coupling regime where you have an exchange photon faster than dissipation. And this is the Rabi splitting here in between the two red levels. And as you can see, as your square root of n goes up, this Rabi splitting increases. Now this Rabi splitting, that means that when you add molecules to a cavity, the other molecules already there are affected. That's like I, when I give talks, if I was giving a talk in, in, in Mumbai or in, in Bangalore, I would, I would say to you that it's like if everybody in the audience would grow as other people come into the room, and then when people leave the room, every people in the audience will start shrinking again. The presence of one affects the properties of all the others. And that's kind of amazing. Of course, the existence of such collective states that run through all the molecules, here molecules are box, so maybe a physicist view of a molecule, these, molecules, these states run through all the molecules. Maybe it depends on if the system is how far it is, but we are talking about 100,000 molecules or more. Then, then uh, obviously, you should affect transport properties. And this is indeed what one sees. Transport properties are modified. This is something we demonstrated. Gino is the, one of the key authors uh, for that. Uh, uh, you know, George in, in Iser Wali. Uh, so how, so now let's do a very simple experiment. You take a glass light, you deposit 10 nanometers of silver or gold, and you spin coat some molecules in a polymer, for example, jagged for that matter, it doesn't matter what you put in. And you make sure that the thickness of the spin coated layer of molecules is just such that the, that the, the distance between the mirror defines an optical mode that can couple to this, that has same energy as this uh, absorption peak of the JAG gas. And when you do that, when you come then with a second mirror down on, the fr on, this, on this film, what you get is a new absorption spectrum. Okay, completely new. And if you're a chemist, you understand that this black guy and the red, per the red species can't be the same. They have totally different absorption spectra, right? So this is, this is kind of surprising. You can go from one to the other just by putting a mirror in between and generating these hybrid states, right? So this is the dashed line is the original one, and here is the two transitions that have been redefined. If you're a synthetic chemist, you would spend a long time trying to make go from one to the other. Now, of course, not all the molecules see the cavity. They, they will be oriented in such a way that they won't interact with the field inside the cavity, and therefore there are always some fraction of molecules that are uncoupled. Okay, this is a very easy experiment to do. So here's, for example, look at emission. So these were jaggets, what I just showed you. Here's the red is the absorption. In dashed line is the fluorescence of the naked J aggregates. And in red is the fluorescence of the coupled, on the electronic strong coupling. And you see that there's new emission, it's blue shifted, but that's a technical, issue, I won't go into that. You see there's still some emission from uncoupled molecules. And the, new, the interesting thing is because this is a cavity and cavity are dispersive. That means that they, the, the cavity response depends on the angle. So uh, uh, an optical cavity like a fabric perot cavity, which we use here, two parallel mirrors. If you, if you look at the function of angle, the transmission wavelength changes. And so the mode here changes. So when you, as you change angle, then you should represent that as momentum, but it's still an angle change. You see that the emission from the polaritonic state shifts with angle. So an angle dependent emission, while well, that, that's, that's coming from the uncoupled molecule part, which is still inside the cavity, emits without changing with angle. Okay. And there's another thing that's very interesting is that the emission is coherent over the extent of the mode. What does that mean? Is that the, even people have done experiments, first it was a group in Lyon who did this, and they published this in 2012, not everybody believed it, but then Terma, Terma's group in Finland, she's a quantum physicist, she repeated this experiment, came out in 2014, slightly different, but the same principle. 
emission from molecules, microns apart, emit in phase, microns apart. Okay? So you put molecules, just jaggets on a flat gold film. They couple with themselves. That's a complicated process, but it doesn't matter. And what you see is that the, you can make the emission of light from different points along the film interfere and see if they produce interference fringes. And they do. If you didn't have strong coupling, you would never see that because all the emission emitters will be totally random. They're not emitting all at the same time. They're all emitting in phase. Like those metronomes, they're emitting in phase. Okay? This is a unique way to doing, to getting uh, coherent emission. Absolutely unique way. So one very important thing. So here's the relationship between angle and momentum. So in chemists don't learn enough about momentum, unfortunately, and dispersion curves, at least not in Europe, maybe in India, I don't know. But normally, if you look at just the dashed green line here, that is the response of an optical cavity as a function of angle, or, and that angle is transformed into momentum, parallel momentum, in-plane momentum, and here's energy. And uh, what is emit was transmitted by the cavity through its mode varies like this in a parabolic way. So when we couple a molecule whose absorption doesn't vary with angle, we, and we have strong coupling, we open a gap. This gap is the anticrossing, and this distance between these, these two branches, the smallest distance between these two branches, is called the Rabi splitting. That's in tune. That's where it's in tune, at that angle. However, we have found over the last 10 years that it actually strong coupling only the, to see an effect on material properties, you have to be coupled at normal incidence. That means k equals zero. That means that the absorption must cross the bottom, the mode at normal incidence, must couple it with the mode at normal incidence. Okay? If you couple like this, nothing happens. You don't see any change in property. And this surprises a lot of people who work in polaritonics, polaritons, because they do lasing, for example, polariton lasing, there are physicists to work on that. They need to be out of, they, not, they mustn't be at the bottom here. They need to be off at an angle because they want to see emission from these states, but uh, efficiently. But if you want to see any, any position, you have to see any change in property, material property, like chemical reactivity, you name it, you need to be at the bottom here. And the way to understand that, there's no theoretical explanation for this. I only have a hand waving argument is that in that condition, when you are strongly coupled, you are, at a, you are at equilibrium, okay? You're at the bottom of the potential energy curve, so it cannot go anywhere. If you, if you start here, the system can lose momentum, which it does in solution by intermolecular interactions, for example, and you can go down here and decouple. At the bottom here, you have essentially just the properties of the optics, and if you are up here, you would end up having just the material properties. So you won't see the hybrid light matter features. So this is very important, critical. A lot of people make this mistake, including us in the beginning until we understood this. So there are a number of things I have to tell you uh, in this regard. So you have these collective states. So these dark states, I already told you, must not be confused with uncoupled molecules. There are still theoreticians out there who think that they are the same. They cannot be, uh, unless it's something weird. And uh, uh, they, uh, they, are, they don't even have to be in the middle in between. There are papers, more recent papers that show that entropy uh, can shift this uh, level here because there's such a large density of them, uh, large density of these dark states. The second point is that the uncoupled, the number of uncoupled molecules, the number of uncoupled molecules is very small because otherwise we couldn't see chemistry uh, when reactions are slowed down. The uncoupled molecules would be dominating. And finally, as I'll show a little bit later on, we are something called non Markovian regime. What's non Markovian? So in physics, a Markovian is a system that has a, a Markovian system as a system, for example, dynamic system that is determined, whose, pro, whose dynamic properties are determined by the 
dynamic properties of its constituents. So if the if uh, if something is uh, uh, very short lived, uh, then the polaritonic states cannot be longer lived than, for example, the the photon in the cavity or the excited state of the starting material. And and actually, as you'll see in all our studies, we are in this non markovian stream. There's no memory of the couples of the of the bare structures from the beginning. And this is particularly true with molecules. Maybe not true with with uh, solid state devices that play on strong coupling, and uh, and means that uh, it's very hard to predict theoretically what's going on because it's very hard to calculate structures in the coupled basis. You cannot start with the uncoupled to determine the couple. You need to study the system in the coupled basis. This is very highly technical, but it's very important. So, any questions at this point? We yes. Work. Yes. We the most difficult part. Yes. Questions are there. Um, uh, there is one question um, uh, previously uh, that we could not take by Abhijit Ray. How can how we can scale vacuum fluctuations in the material medium? How we can see scale scale scale. Understand? Scale. Yeah. We can just uh, so we can turn uh, on turn on even higher. Turn on and they're always there. You yeah. can. You can concentrate. So when you have a, as we'll show here in this, when we make this strong coupling, we do it with a vacuum field. So when we when we define a mode inside the cavity, we enhance the vacuum field in at that that at the location where the mode is. Right. And at other frequencies, we kill it. Okay. 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 Um, then uh, there is a question by Shubha Shubha Vishwas. Generally, state having a node has higher energy, but here it's opposite. Yes, Why? good point. Good point. This is a very good point. So this has been bothering me for years. Actually, we just had a lab meeting this morning, and we discussed this again. Right. This is one of the things that I think have huge impact on certain things. And being a chemist, of course, it was the first thing. One of the first things I noticed is one earth. It was in that order, and uh, and I still don't have the answer for that. Okay, it comes in the theory, the James Cummings theory I showed you. Uh, the next issue is what consequences does it have? We're still trying to do experiments to prove that this has significant consequences. Okay. okay, okay, as you can imagine, and that's that's it. You know, this is a typical thing that I've actually had participated in a Faraday discussion uh, with Gino, uh, uh, George, and other people. When we had a paper on this in London okay. uh, at the Royal Society, and we discussed this one, this one issue we discussed: what does this implications of this? Sure. We could not find that. We could not explain really what it does, okay. and what. But the, we are begin, we're getting there. We're getting there. Great, great. Thanks. Thank you, Shubhu. Um, then there, there is one more question: Why the number of uncoupled oscillators is small? Uh, because as you get coupling strength, that's also a very good question. As the coupling strength increases, uh, you have to remember we have huge coupling strength, okay? We have rubber splitting on the order of, relative to the energy of the transition, we have a very large uh, coupling. And, and that relative value is what is important. And that means that, that, means that all the molecules uh, interact, the number of, even if they're at a weak angle, so they shouldn't couple to the field, they still get pulled in. So I, I often give an illustration. You have a magnet and you have a bunch of metal bars that are oriented differently. And you turn on the magnet force. And as you increase it, more and more of the metal bars will align with the magnetic field. They can pull in things. So when you get very strong coupling, you probably couple in most of the molecules, 90, 95%. Okay. Uh, this is and but then they from... tumble. But yeah. you have another question is then they tumble. So they go in and out and in and out. So what does that do? That's another issue. Okay. We don't know the answer to. Okay. Uh, this is by Professor K.L. Sebastian. Sebastian, you want to unmute and um, just say? Yes, 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 yes. See, the okay. thing is, if a molecule is not oriented correctly, is there enough uh, force to orient it? I'm asking this uh, because yeah. the, the, the strength of the cavity field on any one of them Sorry, is important, of course, question. but it's... <laughs> The second strength question. of the cavity field is definitely important. 
strength of the cavity field is what is definitely important yes of course absolutely uh, so but but, uh, but then the the coupling with a particular molecule scales less 1 by square root of n yeah the coefficient on a particular molecule is 1 by square root of n that means the effect on the molecule is is rather small no because that is that's the that's a okay so i'll i'll start by asking the wrong thing that's take i'm addressing the in the last case you that's because you're thinking you're not doing a collective operator you need to use collective operators to treat this problem when you do that a lot of people in the beginning made that mistake uh well known theoreticians and they treated they said it cannot be an effect on chemistry because you have to redivide by renormalize the square root of n that doesn't you have to deal with collective uh operators then you don't have that problem you can see that you don't have that because you get new emission states from the collective coupling which have energies which are far uh, which shows that the, you are dealing with collective state that has a splitting of the collective splitting so the emission event that occurs so are, in a molecule so are you are you saying that there is a huge effect on each molecule yes and that's the reason by experiments you have to listen wait till we have shown the experiments okay this is demonstrate and also theory now there's no question that the top groups all understand that uh Yeah, well, you see, the wave function, as I said earlier, it has only one by square root of n. So yeah, have... anyway, I shall wait. You will give some references to. Yeah, it? yeah. Well, you can just look at any other more recent theory papers, and you can look at the first ones, which made the same analysis, in, but it's wrong. I'm sorry, sorry to say. Now, coming to do with the orientation, the, whether the, there's a force on the molecules. Yes, we've been looking for that. We've looked for that for years. Uh, if it's, but there's, I don't think it can easily overcome. Uh, is strong enough to overcome kt yeah that's thermal that's my problem agitation. yeah that's so exactly my problem because thermal fluctuations will destroy it what thermal fl right. fluctuations will destroy whatever coherence you have uh yes of course but it depends uh, it depends on the time scale okay Uh, you have to wait till I show you the data. You'll be hopefully be convinced. Okay. There are many people who okay. who don't. This is what I was saying earlier on. There are many people who don't think these experiments are possible, and maybe I won't convince you at the end. But uh, people around the world are sure that this okay. is possible. So, so the, uh, okay, I shall I shall wait. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's wait. Um, I will get back to people who have raised their hands. Um, I'll take first uh, Satish. Satish, please yes. ask your question. So, yeah. Can Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. So I think the coupled uh, state you said that uh, you form this uh, the molecule form this coherent state and it can boost the transport. That's yeah. one of the statement in a, your earlier slide. So yeah. how how far this delocalization length in the coherent state? Oh, in, the, in said, the, yeah. yeah. You said you have sorry. Uh, let me. So you said you have a coupled state to the the cavity and you have uncoupled state within the cavity. Mm -hmm. so those uncoupled state i would expect still disorder they are not part of the coherent states mm -hmm. so how that is going to boost the transport you have a mixture of coherent and incoherent states so indeed so yeah. as i will show you it, it of course the boost in transport is limited it if it was if it was as high as uh, as the number of molecules that participate the square root of n we will, if there was any fluctuations with time thermal fluctuations this would be fantastic Yeah. We never see that, of course. Uh, we see factors of ten. Other people see similar things. Uh, now there's even in electrochemistry experiments you can see enhanced ionic transport. Uh, you can see it in uh, Gino has a paper in TMDs the online uh, factor of fifty. So that kind of tells you the sort of limit of what you can uh, the reality. So what I expect is that for a moment you have some coherence for a certain domain size. Mm. and then it breaks up and you know it helps but it of course is not there okay okay so you you so okay so you so, so, so it's not like uh, so especially not molecular materials because of all the agitation we're doing this at room temperature on top of it but you know i mean i can tell you the experiments that are going to come out on uh, showing that uh, that uh, things like um, like quantum hall effect numbers are are totally perturbed by by strong coupling Mm. and collective strong coupling okay. so you know that i mean this is there's fundamental changes 
And so if there were just tiny splittings and it was just a local thing, there, there, none of these things would be observed. No. So, okay. uh, so uh, anyway, so the okay. strong coupling, we did not invite, sorry. No, no, no go ahead, go ahead, finish your no, it's fine. Yes. So a strong coupling was not, of course, invented by us. It was nothing to do with that. Our step is just a, a latest step in this field. Actually, the very early classical experiments were done on phonons with surface plasmons were predicted by Gronovich and done by Zizin, 70s. Atom cavities systems were well, Roche, Kimball, Rempe, people that I've all, at least the Roche and Rempe, I know very well. Then they were done in semiconductors by Weisbusch in Japan. This led to a whole new activity on quantum wells. These systems are very well defined, very stable in time and so forth. Okay. The, the, the atom cavity system, single atom simulator, required a, cavities with such a high finesse that it took 17 years to make the system. 17 years. <laughs> so there we are at the other end. We are the poor man's QED, it's light matter strong coupling. The mo molecules actually started very early. In 82, the same from the same group that did the, the long wave budget film on top of a mirror, the, the Drecksage, the same, uh, same group of scientists in Germany also showed that you could do strong coupling. This was forgotten, and, we, and in 98, uh, two groups, one in Japan and a Nature paper, they Lidz et al. repeated the, essentially these type of experiments, and uh, and uh, and it was seen as novel, novel enough to go into nature, which is not the first time that kind of thing happens. And so then there were lots of interesting experiments on on polariton lasing condensation done by on semiconductors, which was then repeated on molecules by Kina Cohen and, and Steve Forrest, notably, and also by people at IBM in Germany. So what you can do is you can get a Bose-Einstein condensate uh, at room temperature with, these, with this strong coupling, which also would seem impossible. Why? Because the rabbit splitting is the collective rabbit splitting affects every, all the molecules and is not, you don't renormalize again by square root of n because otherwise you couldn't do these experiments. So, the, the key thing is, so where, where did I come into this? Well, I read an article, I'm gonna show it to you now, and I said, what on earth does it do to just non-material properties? And I want to show you how I got there because a lot of people ask me that, how on earth did I think of this? How did I, as a physical chemist, get involved in this? And I'm gonna show you. So uh, actually I read this article when I joined NEC, this is 31, 32 years ago. So in January 89, I'm in Japan, totally lost, at the first, like my first serious working experience in Japan, not my first one, but the first serious one. And I'd work at NEC Corporation and a physicist I share office with gave me a physics today, which I didn't know what it was. That's the sort of chemical engineering use of physics. And they had these feature articles, which are great. And one written by a Russian Klepner, who I didn't know who they were, on cavity quantum electrodynamics. And when I read this, they talked about Gregor Sage's work. And this fascinated me that you could in this very accessible article that they could, you could actually modulate emission properties that there were states for, for light. I was a photochemist, I didn't know all this. How come we didn't learn this? This bothered me, but I saw an opportunity to control molecular properties. And so I had, I had a physicist make, uh, in, in a nanofabrication engineer at NEC Corporation, make me little cylinders in a metal film to, to uh, to put molecules inside, uh, act as little test tubes, metallic test tubes, because I needed a cavity. And I thought it'd be great if I have a little test tube, I'd excite by UV and look at fluorescence, for example, change or change the radiative rate properties in the inside these cavities. And I could work on something at that time was very important was the correlation between fluorescence lifetime and solvent dynamics. That was a hot topic in 1988. And, uh, and so I thought this is a solution to study this. And when I got the array back from this, uh, this Japanese uh, colleague, he, he asked me how large I wanted. And I told him uh, over a square, I wanted a hole of every micrometer in a square centimeter because I didn't know how to do any other. I need to use normal equipment, chemist, chemistry equipment to do the experiment. And there was a little bit of cultural misunderstanding. And, but he reluctantly went and did the experiments, uh, did the sample for me, even though I didn't, because I didn't realize how complicated this was to do over a square centimeter. So I got a, a square centimeter on a, on a glass slide with a hundred million, 100,000, 100 million holes. Okay, 100 million cylinders. And what I immediately, I, it was so big that I could see through the holes, whole array. 
And this surprised me. How on earth could I see through the whole array? And when a single hole was only 300 nanometers in diameter and shouldn't transmit much light, according to Hans Bethe's theory. Then I took a spectrum, normalized the whole area, and there was more light going through the holes and actually falling on the holes. Then I tried to show this to theoreticians, and they got absolutely this is impossible. My boss was a, uh, uh, had been trained in optics. The MEC had a large optics uh, group, a theory and experiment. And at the time, and, and, uh, and my boss had been trained at this at MIT with Ippen, and he said to me, no, that's impossible. Uh, you know, a hole like that, that diameter should transmit uh, one in a thousand photons, and you're transmitting more than the number of photons that hit the metal. This is absurd. And so, uh, but some people told me, no, no, this must be real. Go ahead and you should try to do it. So it took me nine years to publish the paper. Okay. Just to show you this. This was discovered in 89 and it, it published in 98. Why? Because I had no explanation. Uh, here is an example of a whole array on there uh, done by a student up in the corner with HU and shows you how bright they are under the microscope. They emit like mad, these whole arrays. So, uh, it turns out that all these peaks in the transmission peaks are due to the fact that light is trapped on the surface of the metal. Light accumulates above, amplitude of light accumulates above the hole and essentially concentrate the lights of the hole. They tunnel to the second surface and get re-emitted. There's a three-step process. Now, uh, uh, this was very surprising, and, uh, but when we published it, of course, it generated a lot of interest in the plasmonic community. And it is very simple. You can tune, I use these structures for strong coupling, so that's why I'm showing you this. You can tune the resonances of these whole arrays just by changing the, the spacing between the holes, among other things. And these are real colors seen on the optical microscope. And then there are versions of it, including the bullseye that you already saw, which, which has generated a lot of interest. And uh, this original paper, which a lot of people were skeptical about, there are lots of skeptical papers about this finding in the beginning, now has at least 6,000 citations by itself. So that shows you that eventually you can overcome, overcome uh, skepticism. Eventually, we studied single holes, wondering how single holes occur. You know, what is, what's the properties of those? And when we did this, oh, here's the beaming stuff. Yeah, this is, uh, I've showed it already. There's the, that's a near field image. Of the, on top of the surface, you can see the light is very intense on top of the, the near field is very intense on top of the surface. So single holes have resonances just like particles. Many of you probably work with you know, non metallic nanoparticles, but holes is just the anti antiparticles. So they have resonance just the same way. And you can tune them if you're with polarization, for example, if you have a rectangular hole. Then we studied diffraction of these holes. And it turns out the fraction is something that was understood in 1665 by Grimaldi in Bologna. Here's a picture, it looks very modern from this 1665 paper, apparently. This is his original paper, uh, image from this original paper to show the spot size is bigger than the geometrical definition of the light through the apertures. And we restudied this for this, and we found actually that there were four different re diffraction regimes for small holes, depending on the relationship versus the diameter. Why? Because the mat material matters. In this, all the theory on diffraction until then assumes that the metal, the screen in which the hole is made, is inert. But you know and we know that surface plasmons, among other things, play important roles. So the matter matters huh? in these experiments. And this is sort of a very fundamental issue, but I want to show you that out of these quite a different research, my original target was strong coupling or in weak and strong coupling, you get something on the way that you didn't expect. So this took me away from what I wanted to do. And then the question is, I'll skip this. And then I came to, to strong coupling. So yeah. I came back to I, strong I coupling. Think, I think Thomas, uh, if it's okay with you, we yeah. can stop here today uh, because we might okay. have a few more questions for okay. the material that you presented. Okay. Uh, and maybe next uh, uh, okay. tomorrow's tutorial, you can start exactly from that point. Is that, okay. is that a good point to start? Yes. Okay, so sure. I let you, you're the MC. <laughs> no, because there's already a lot of stuff that- Yeah, yeah, sure, <laughs> I'm here, that's what I'm, it's, it's, uh, I have more slides than I can deal with, so- Yeah, 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 sure, sure, Thomas. So we will now take um, uh, questions. So first I would like to thank Thomas again, um, just to uh, sort of, we will at the end formally conclude the session, but I just want to thank you because 
there's a lot of very exciting things that you talked about and you developed the vacuum fluctuations pretty well. Um, uh, it's, it's hard to get this kind of uh, uh, in-depth explanation. So uh, thank you for doing that. I will now invite, uh, there are lots of questions already hands raised. I will first invite uh, a physicist, Achanta Venugopal, who is from GIFR. Achanta, uh, Gopal, could you? Thank you. Yes, uh, thanks. Uh, it, it's really wonderful talk. Like the way you introduced is really amazing. Right. Thank so you. I have one question, like which you kind of skipped saying that it's a technical aspect. I just wanted to ask you about the blue shift which you are observing. So uh, actually, that's a very complicated question. So it might be just there are two possible explanations for the blue shift in the emission process. You mean versus the absorption? Okay. There's no. There's no way we're not. Uh, uh, there's a real problem with P minus. P minus is the lowest polar tonic. And I, there are very weird things. We've already published this. You cannot, but Gino George knows this very well. He was much involved with this, is that when you pump P minus, you actually don't get an excited state. Okay. okay? Mm -hmm. And you don't see it in transit spectrum. You don't see it in the action spectrum of the emission or the, or the excited state if the molecules are very rigid. If the molecules start being floppy, you start seeing this. And so it looks like there's some selection rule, hidden selection rule to, to generate, to go to P minus. At the same time, it absorbs. So what is this absorption if it doesn't generate a state? So it could be just a dissipation. It could be a, like a chronic Kramer type situation where you just have some, some dissipation, but not, you have a selection rule that, uh, that prohibits, prohibits you from going there. We're working on that. The, 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 yeah, that's one of the things. And this comes back to the fact that it has a node. And this issue that somebody brought up, I don't know if it was you or somebody else brought up, and this is fascinating. And we still, I, st I, th I think it's a very fundamental issue. And there's also an issue of symmetry in these systems. I'll come to that tomorrow. Uh, the symmetry plays a key role. And so uh, is this a role here too? Uh, playing a role here. We are doing experiments now to see if the selection rules are different than what we thought. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah. So this is, of course, makes the blue shift very strange because what does it actually mean? So I cannot tell you exactly. I can just tell you the question that it has raised in our minds. Right. We, we do see similar things. So there's one more question which I want to ask you, a very simple clarification is, uh, uh, I mean, you mentioned the collective uh, excitation as one of the, I mean, as the reason or the origin of these uh, uh, enhancements which we see. Is there any possibility of uh, plasmon mediated electron delocalization, electron wave function delocalization as a, as a possible origin or explanation to the- On the surface, you mean on the surface? Yes, on the surface, yes. Uh, I mean, Okay, if you put molecules on a metal surface, like they do with these physicists do with Jack, it's, it's spread them on the surface. There's no question that they interact with the metal surface because they actually, they generate an image mode, a surface plasma image mode which couples to the molecules. Kind of weird, the metal okay. film is flat. Mm -hmm. And that's what generates the strong coupling, the image mode, the image of the right. dipoles, the transition right. dipoles. Right. So yes, it interacts, but that cannot explain the, I mean, you still have the signature of strong coupling, you have anti-crossing, you have uh, Rabi splitting and coherent emission of a micrometer, of a micrometer at room temperature. Because, the, because that micrometer matches with the plasma propagation length. Absolutely, absolutely. So of course that, that was also linked, but those two, very good point. They, uh, so, but uh, uh, yes, but when the molecules are on there, the wavelength of coupling them, at the wavelength of where the emission is occurring, there's the, pro the plasmons will not be propagating because there's too much absorbance of the molecules. So the molecules cannot propagate that long. On the free film, of course, it propagates microns. Absolutely, totally correct. But the moment you put the molecules in at that wavelength, where the absorption emission, which are often very close, the, 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 the plasma gets stops, comes to a screeching halt. Okay? And that's what generates the coupling. Thing. Strong coupling. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, Gopal. Thank you for that question. Uh, I would like to go to Liang Yang Su, uh, who has raised his hand for considerably long time. Yang, could you unmute yourself? 
Jodishman, Kyuki, yes. uh, Hello, and Yeah. Yeah, so... just a second. Yeah, yeah, just a second. Just uh, Jeno, Jeno, could you finish your? Yeah, your if you point? don't mind, like Thomas, we had some discussion about the the first question of what Ajanta was asking about. Okay, okay, as a question blue tomorrow. Shift. Blue shift. Okay. Uh, the blue shift uh, uh, mostly in semiconductor strong coupling. It was explained as like polariton polariton interaction that shift to high energy. I think uh, some of this discussion was uh, there in like semiconductor strong coupling. So I don't know, this can be translated into molecular state. I'm talking about polariton polariton interaction after it forms. Yeah, it's, it's possible. It's absolutely possible. We have no evidence of it, but it's because you can do intensity studies to, to see that. And we have never seen any intensity effect. In a mono monophotonic regime, I mean, we have no, no, we would see as we, if that was the case, as you increase the light intensity, number of polaritons would increase and you'd see a, a shift. Right. Uh -huh. So that's the easy control experiment. But it depends on the system. You know, sometimes things look similar and they're not, you know, so the blue shift in semiconductors and the blue shift in our system might be very different. All right. Yeah, so uh, I don't know, Markovian regime exists for semiconductors, but not for molecules, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. Similar kind of thing, you know, it depends on, uh, molecules are so disordered system <laughs> that a lot of things, other processes occur in parallel. Thank you, thank you. Okay, thank you, Gino. Um, Liang, um, so uh, could you please unmute yourself? You can ask a question. Oh. <laughs> You know, actually, I, I don't have a question today. Yeah, it's a very nice talk. Huh? I'm looking forward to tomorrow's about the like, chemical reactions. It's oh, very exciting. Okay, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Lian. Thank you. That was just, uh, he was just commenting on your fantastic talk. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you. for You should join tomorrow as well. Thank you. Um, any other question? There were uh, some questions in chat. Yes, for? There, are, there, there are questions. So, Krishna Priya, could you please unmute yourself? Krishna, Krishna Priya? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, so, um, uh, first of all, thank you so much for this wonderful uh, talk. Um, my first question is about uh, the um, energy level ordering of uh, polaritonic and uh, reservoir states. So, um, can this, uh, so in all the systems that you have described so far, the highest energy is. Uh, upper polariton, then the dark states, and then the lower polaritonic states. So can this ordering of states um, be different? No, not as far as I know. Uh, oh. you, can add, you can add more polaritonic states with Gino, George. We, we have a paper where we have like five rabbi splittings, you know, extends out. I don't know if I have time to show that anymore tomorrow, but we have a paper in PRL with Gino George's first author from 2000, I don't know what. And uh, where well, you see five polaritonic states, you can, you can couple more than one molecule and, and I'll show that tomorrow and make other intermediate polaritonic states, use one polariton state to create other polaritonic states. And then you can get more polaritonic states, but I don't think you can, you can change the order if you have a just simple two states. Oh, okay. So uh, I remember uh, some uh, discussions in the community about how the uh, coherent nature of the polaritonic states um, having low entropy could alter this energy level yeah. ordering. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, that's, yeah, that's, uh, that's the work of Greg Cole yeah. from Princeton. Uh, very interesting paper, we cited uh, and so forth. Uh, uh, in our recent review in science, and and uh, and uh, uh, this predicts from a von Neumann type uh, entropy that the, the states will lower. And of course, if that's if that conf I, I, nobody has done the experiments to prove this, but if that's the case, it has a huge it's a huge issue because it okay. would change it would explain a lot of things. I took okay. that very seriously, and we enter. I have talked. I've spoken with him many times about this. Yeah. Okay, thank so, you. So far, only. I have one more question. Oh, yes, Krishna. Yes, Krishna. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, you were talking about uh, how uh, some of the molecules 
may not uh, interact with the field because they are oriented in different direction. So yeah. if we make all the molecules uh, to orient in the perfectly yes. with the field, can yes. we make a dark state population yeah. null? Yeah, so, so we have tried that. We and other people have tried that. It turns out it doesn't make much difference. So that's why we stopped. That's because when we are, that's what I was claiming before, the molecules, uh, even when if the, strong, if the coupling is strong enough, even other molecules will orient themselves. Not orient themselves, they will be coupled even at weak angles. Okay? Oh, okay. So, so, so in the width of the, of the, the, they, the strong company will catch, let's say, 90% 90, 90 of molecules. And if you have that, 95 at least. And if you have that, there's no, there's no point of trying to orient them. In the beginning, okay. we thought that. So we had worked with people who make liquid crystals and we tried all, we had all things we want to do. But in the end, we didn't see it was very hard. It wasn't worth the trouble. You might gain okay. a little bit, but not much. Okay, so uh, even in a theoretical uh, perspective, does it make sense to imagine if, if at all we can uh, realize such a system? Yeah, it would make sense if you're looking for things like conductivity. Okay. Then it would make sense because you will add order and you will have this coherence length probably will be improved. Okay. Right? So this okay. one we talk about. So let's say you have all the molecules. Let's say, let's say you could orient Let's say the strong coupling tells you that about 100,000 molecules are strongly coupled in one go in a coherent state. Then okay. if you have 100,000 molecules orient the same way, you would have no interruption in this domain. Mm -hmm. That would improve uh, transport, in my, okay. opinion, uh, in my opinion, in my modest opinion. Yeah. Sure. So if we consider the far few molecular regime uh, and only look at, like, say, 10 molecules, and we make them perfectly orient using uh, appropriate linkers and such. Uh, would that work? I didn't hear very clearly what you said. Can you repeat it? Oh, uh, sorry. So I was asking, uh, so uh, you mentioned about uh, um, an uh, ensemble uh, uh, perspective when we have such large number of molecules. Yes. Uh, but if you are looking at a few number of molecules in a cavity, let's say 10, 20 molecules in one cavity yeah. in such a system, uh, if we can perfectly orient molecules using linkers and such, and we can control them, uh, will that uh, reduce the dark state population? Uh, no, the dark state population has nothing to do with orientation. The dark oh, okay. states have to do with n. They're just n minus the the yeah, n yeah. plus two states and the n states dark states. Okay, n yeah, minus yeah. one. Sorry, the n plus one states and n minus one dark states. So the n my n. If you have ten, you'll have a, a nine dark states. Whether you're orient or independent of orientation, I mean, if you have them all coupled, you will have those n minus one states. Okay. Um, I think okay. let's move okay. to the next one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think. Yeah, Krishna, I, uh, we will have tomorrow sure, as well. Sure. So, so okay, let, okay. let us give yeah. other people an opportunity. Okay, okay, okay. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, we have uh, Professor Josh <laughs> Thomas and then Jaibir Singh. Yeah, I have, uh, Professor Abbasan, I have this uh, uh, question regarding this drug strike experiment, which is presented in slide number 19. So, beautiful experiment. Uh, where they, they, you can, when you move this ruthenium, not ruthenium, europium complex. Uh, yes. Uh, away from the metal, you see this beautiful fluctuation. Uh, yeah. Is there any effect of the field on it? Uh, I'm talking about the plus the metal field. Metal creates a field. There is a propagating plus on on it. Yeah, no, it's not. It's not considered to be. It's a good point, uh, but it's not not considered to be uh, to be. Let me escape this and just uh, why can't I escape this? One of the fascinating experiments, if I would yeah, say. Yeah, I know. I, I, uh, I think I'm locked into this thing. Um, 19, slide number 19. Yeah, but I wish I could do yeah, this. He's slide. not able to move the slide. He's not able to move the slide. It's That's okay. Fine. Okay. Yes, yes. Uh, 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 
yeah, if I, I can't even see what I'm doing. So uh, yeah, that would be helpful. What did you do now? You put something on the side. Oh, there it is. I see. Okay, here we go. I didn't know this was possible. Yeah. So here, this is this. Of course, you, when you're close, you you are coupling the, the to the metal and the plasma probably, and you quench. But this, this oscillation here is not not believed to be due to plasmons. Okay. This is just simply predicted by density of state. Okay. So uh, uh, you know. Uh, the, the reason is if it's plasma, so it's very hard to understand why it goes up and down like this. Okay, thank you. Thank you. For this. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Thomas. Um, uh, Jaybir Singh? Jaybir Singh? Yeah, hello. Thank you, sir, for a nice talk. Like the, the question which troubles me the most is like, since we are saying they are more is dispersive and it is like present at higher angle also that why we say that at only at normal incidence is the 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 mode which is acting to the highest extent i will go to the i will go to the uh, here uh, further Oh, okay. Let me. This is so hard to work with this way. Yeah. So okay. So I won't worry about getting this line. But you have to. What you're asking is why does it have to be at k equals zero? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Like uh, for when we are doing our experiment, uh, I'm also doing my experiment. So here we we think like. At why we say at the the mode which is forming at normal incidence is acting the most in case of like the tuning experiment that we are doing. This is the question that I have from very like I'm not able to understand. You're asking why mm -hmm. that normal incidence is the best? Is that what you're saying? I can't... Yes, yes. Why the normal incidence because is the because best? Because at the normal incidence, you're at the bottom of the parabola. So you couple at the bottom of the parabola, so the polaritonic state is also at the bottom. That's our hand-waving argument. We have no theoretical backup, okay? But okay. recent, the, the most sophisticated theory with ab initio calculations, QED, DFDD calculations done in, in Germany, in, in Max Planck in Germany by Alan, uh, by Arjen Rubio's group, he shows in a very recent paper, which is online, that he finds the same resonance effect, okay? And he has different explanations yeah. for it, but certainly the simplest way to understand is that you're stuck at the bottom. So you stay in the polaritonic state as you're doing the experiment. Yes, okay, yes. Okay, Jaibi, thank you for asking the question. Uh, yeah. There's a last question from Indrajit Mukhopadhyay. Indrajit, could you unmute yourself, please? Indrajit? Hi. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. Go ahead, Indrajit. Indrajit, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. That was a very interesting, uh, you know, talk and very new things we are learning. Uh, my question is that uh, your cavity experiment, you have shown that uh, uh, different color uh, of, uh, you know, uh, light matter interactions because of the cavity and number of molecules in the cavity. Now, can this experiment be extended to more a pattern? If I create more a pattern and do light matter interactions, can we expect this kind of uh, color? In where? In where? The Moiré pattern. The Moiré pattern. Is. The French. Method. Oh, the yes. Moiré pattern. Yeah. Moiré pattern. Yes. And, and what? What did you want to ask about the Moiré pattern? If I if, if I want to uh, you know conduct experiment uh, creating Moiré pattern and then light incident light matter yeah. interactions and can I have the, this kind of uh, you know uh, kind of uh, uh, light matter interactions? Can I expect? Strong coupling. With, with, with the Moiré if, Moiré. if you had a Moiré pattern, you mean? Yes. If you yes, had a yes, pattern. yes. Yes. Well, it's a good question. Well, you know what's been. You, I'm sure you know what's been done with graphene on that score. So uh, maybe this will also affect uh, the outcome. Huh? Uh, nice. There are many experiments you can do like that uh, with the structures below and the high. But I, I don't. I mean, you'd have to use a surface plasma on structure, and I don't know how you. Wire pattern, but you certainly could. If you could, uh, it would uh, affect properly. I imagine. Thank you. Yeah. 
the moire pattern has definitely influenced a lot of uh, super resolution imaging for example yep. yes yes actually we have very interesting observations from it so i uh, from sure. this talk actually i got more clue basically very good very good indraji thank you yes. thank you for attending and please continue to attend and tomorrow stop as well indraji thank sure, you sure 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 i am looking forward to attend it thank you thank you um okay i think satish we have come to an end yeah. um uh, for this session and i think there was a lot of excitement lot of questions um thomas thank you for doing this so wonderfully well you kept everybody engaged and you had this uh, sequence of slides where you had questions posed so i think that really helped and um, you could go through the talk with some coherence and then you had to take a break so i think that that was good so thank you thank you thank you um, uh, we will we will continue to everyone we will continue tomorrow exactly at 5 pm just like today and please join us with more questions i think i i hope uh, thomas will go show some experiments tomorrow and uh, we'll really yes, uh, tomorrow i will just go through a whole bunch of experiments of different yes. topics yes yes thank you material science chemistry material yeah. science yeah changing properties okay perfect perfect thomas thank you thank you for doing this okay. I, um, thank you um, you, I, um, you have to unblock my screen though yes <laughs> You have to yes. You have to unshare. Yes, I cannot escape now. Can no you? Way. Oh, can I? Maybe you can. You can. No. Yes, I did that. Oh, okay. <laughs> I get my computer screen back. Cool. Right. Cool. Yeah. Cool.